accidental uh, that we uh, <laughs> chose that song. I, I chose that one before we even knew that there might be a hurricane coming through New England. Uh, <laughs> but the words are so appropriate. I'll keep singing. This one we haven't done in a long time. Um, uh, the words go really quickly, but they're so good. It's about God's mercy. Uh, so here it is. I hope you like it. Thank 
God is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone from the first to the last hath won my affections and bound my soul fast. Without thy sweet mercy, I could not live here. Sin would reduce me to water despair. But through thy free goodness, my spirits revive. And he that first made me still keeps me alive. Thy mercy is more than match for my heart which wonders to feel its own hardness depart dissolved by thy goodness i fall to the ground and weep for the praise of the mercy i found hallelujah great father of mercies thy goodness i own and the covenant love of thy crucified Son. All praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness mine. All praise to the Spirit whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon and righteousness Well, hello and welcome to Calvary Bible Church. My name is Colin Taranzini, and I am the youth pastor here. And we just want to say thank you for choosing to worship here with Calvary Bible Church. A couple quick announcements before we move on. First and foremost, divorce care starting September 15th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. Meeting at the TLC. The cost is $20. And you can see Scott and Annette Hoyle for more um, uh, question comments or to sign up not only that but i'm excited very 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 excited to announce that on september 22nd we start awana back up and that is exciting yeah praise god for that that's going to be uh, from 6 p.m to 7 30 p.m and that is uh three years old all the way up to sixth grade and so uh if you uh, we need a lot of people to partner in that, um, to help teach that, um, to coordinate things uh, re in regards to that. But also, you may say, well, we're not really into the children's side of ministry. Well, that's okay. You can partner just by praying. Pray for those students. Pray for uh, the leaders and the teachers. Pray for everyone involved in such a great ministry. Not only that, we are a member-attended, supported church, which means by your faithfulness in giving, we are able to fund those, uh, those opportunities for ministry. So three ways you can give. First, you can go to uh, cbcvt.org backslash giving, and you can give that way. You can give just by going out in the Conversation Cafe, and you're going to find a white box. Um, or the third way, you can do snail mail. You can mail a check to uh, Calvary Bible Church, and our address is 2 uh, Meadow Lane in Rutland, Vermont. So three ways you can give there. Not only that, but I just want to report uh, from Student Impact Ministry that we are seeing new faces every week, and not only that, we have an opportunity to baptize one of, uh, one of the girls that go there in a couple weeks. So praise God for what Calvary Bible uh, church is doing. Praise God for their impact within our community and the fact that we get to be light in a dark, dark society. So praise God for everything that's going on. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you that we can meet as a faith family and we can worship you. And Father, I pray that you would bring revival here. To each and every one of us, I pray that there would be conviction, that there would be encouragement, that there would be just an outpouring of adoration and praise to you, God. Father, 
I pray right now, as, as our hearts may be heavy, thinking about the, the hurricane that's coming up the coast, or, or maybe our thoughts and our minds are, are with the, the people of Afghanistan that are being persecuted. We're reminded today that before the foundations of the world, you knew and you saw all that was coming. And so, Father, we pray that we would rest in you today, that we would worship you and we would exalt your name. Be with us now. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand up and we'll worship some more. One of the things that uh, I've learned when you do go through the storms of life is that it is so crucial, so essential to remember that God is good. God is good.
seated and kids you can be dismissed to kids church your teachers will meet you out in the lobby there and they will take you up to your classroom have a fun time It is good to be with you today. I remember hearing a a fictional story about a guy that was marooned on a deserted island. And uh, eventually, after five years, a ship came to rescue him. And the captain came onto the island and looked around and, and heard that he had been living alone for five years. And he noticed there were three huts on the island. Three little little shacks that, the, that had been built. And so he asked the man about the shack, and the man pointed to one and said that he lived in this hut. And then he pointed to the second hut, and he said, this is where I go to church. And the captain said, well, what about the third hut? And he said, well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> it would uh, be even funnier if it wasn't so true. I think one of the biggest uh, hindrances to the gospel today is uh, um, divisiveness in the church, consumerism in the church, and and too many churches have lost sight of the gospel, and the church has started to look more like a country club where its members take golfing lessons from pros rather than a rescue operation that recognizes that they are fighting a spiritual war where literal lives and eternities are at stake. And so often churches become uh, um, inundated with, with politics, and that can have disastrous consequences. And um, if you've been following the news, uh, I'm sure that you, like myself, uh, were heartbroken over what's happening in, in Afghanistan. And it is easy uh, for us to, to blame others, to wag our fingers. Uh, but we as Christians, we are called to uh, be spiritual intercessors. We are called to be engaged in spiritual warfare on our knees, no matter which political party you may belong to. We are commanded as Christians to pray for our president, to pray for our senators, to pray for our representatives. Uh, In fact, uh, 1 Timothy 2, uh, Paul uh, says, I urge, first of all, First of all, I urge you, he says, this is of utmost importance, that that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. And then he says, specifically, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly, dignified in every way. He says, this is good, it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he says, there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. And I think that is so important for us to remember that it is not just uh, uh, us against them, that that no matter uh, what country you live in, uh, that no matter where you are, God loves each and every person. Um, And I know there's a lot of voices mudslinging. Uh, But it's important for us to have compassion for what is happening around the world as we see these things and recognize that there are are Christians that are being persecuted and there are pre-Christians. And and what happens in politics affects their ability to hear the gospel. Uh, One year, um, you may notice I'm wearing my Penn State uh, uh, shirt here. I I did go to Penn State uh, for my undergrad. That's where I met Christy. 
And uh, one year before I graduated, uh, it was actually uh, one year before 9-11 as well. And, uh, and so it, the, in, in Afghanistan, the, the Taliban was, was in control and things were happening there. Uh, but one year before I graduated, uh, uh, Chris and I were kind of in this pre-dating phase, and we decided that we were going to take the summer off before my senior year and go on a missions trip and just run hard after God and see what he did. And so we did, and so we decided to each go on a missions trip, and she went to Ethiopia, and I went to San Diego. Uh, I know, <laughs> judge me, right? I run hard after Jesus. You can tan for him, too. Um, so, uh, so I went to San Diego. It was actually a really good missions trip, and we went down and uh, back and forth to Mexico, and you can cross the border. Uh, but while I was there, the staff did something interesting to kind of open our eyes to what was happening around the world. And, and they put on what was called an international dinner. And, uh, and so each of us, and let's just say there were 100 people on the missions trip, 100 college students that were doing evangelism throughout San Diego, and, uh, and we all got invitations to various countries. And so um, some people got invitations to, you know, China and, and uh, um, North America, South America, uh, England, you know, kind of big regions like that. And I got an invitation to go and dine in Afghanistan. You know, and I was, I was, I said, oh, that's interesting, okay, and um, didn't know much about the country, and so uh, it told me where I should go, and so I went, and uh, and I went to the the, the place where they had um, assigned us to go and eat, and I was expecting, um, you know, a Middle Eastern food, you know, all the, all the, you know, all the, all the, I didn't know what to expect, but I went in this room, and uh, myself and maybe two other students, and we went in, and there was uh, two of the staff dressed head to toe in military outfits uh, with, with, you know, toy machine guns, you know, uh, on, on their arms, and they ushered us into the room at, uh, you know, toy gunpoint and told us to get on our knees and pray to Allah. And I'm like, is this a Christian missions trip? What is this? You know, and, and, um, and, and so they, you know, they, they, you know, kicked some dirt at us and said, pray to Allah. Right? And I'm like, what, what is going on? You know, and and, um, you know, one of the students played along. He's like, I'm not going to do that. And so they, they put me in a corner and they, you know, they, you know, uh, you know made the, and I was like, where's the food? All right. And, and this went on for a couple hours. All right. And, and eventually we were like, okay, you know, what is going on? And they wouldn't let us leave. And, um, and so meanwhile, in this dinner, um, all these other students were experiencing um, <laughs> a, a dinner. Uh, they actually got some food. And so most of the students got invitations to China, and uh, they were ushered into a very, uh, you know, tightly packed room where they were packed there, and they were given rice for their dinner. Um, uh, that was from South America. They were given, like, some tortilla chips or some other things like that. Uh, um, England was given cold-cut sandwiches uh, for their dinner. And, um, uh, and, and so the, the students started to move around. You know, China, they weren't allowed to leave the room, but, uh, uh, you know, Europe and uh, uh, Africa was given couscous, some things like that. They were able to move around, and they noticed that in the center of the area that we were staying, uh, in the courtyard, there was a lavish table set up. And uh, the, there were six students that were invited to dine in America, and they had a full Thanksgiving meal with all the fixings. Uh, the staff were dressed in tuxedos, serving them uh, food from, from real silverware. And there was more food to feed everybody on that missions trip together. And, um, and, and so, uh, so the other countries were looking down. They're like, hey, give us some. And the Americans were like, no, you know, you got your invitation to yours, you know. <laughs> um, you, you eat your food. And, uh, and so the night went on like that. And at the end, we, we had a time to debrief. And uh, uh, we, we figured out what it is that they were trying to communicate to us is that the food represented the gospel. And, uh, and the countries and the food that they got represented kind of their availability to it. Uh, you know, with, uh, with England, you know, the, 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 uh, there's a coldness uh, in, in the church uh, with, uh, um, you know, there, there's, and, and in Afghanistan where I was, there was no food and nobody was allowed to come in or come out. We were trapped. And for the longest time, that was the, the picture in Afghanistan. And so uh, in the last uh, two decades, you know, we've seen some opening and, and Christians were able to go in and, and share the gospel. And I wonder what's going to happen. Uh, now and so uh, you start to realize that that political games have real consequences, and we are so blessed in this country to have an abundance of food that we can gather together and we can come to a place like this and we can hear the gospel without fear of uh, of our lives. And so we need to be in prayer, prayer for our leaders, uh, pray that they would reject what the world calls wisdom and instead seek God's wisdom 
That's what we're going to learn today in James 3. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. James chapter 3, we're going to find out the difference between human wisdom and God's wisdom. So James chapter 3, and uh, I'm going to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word. Uh, We like to do this uh, just to uh, show our respect and honor for what God would want us to hear from his word. James chapter 3, I'm going to be reading out of ESV today, starting in verse 13. James writes, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Father, uh, you tell us that if we lack wisdom uh, to ask you. And so we ask you today for wisdom. Help us to to learn and grow as we look to you through your word and uh, in order to become more like Jesus. Uh, We ask you today to to guide the leaders of our nation. Uh, We ask you to soften hearts. Uh, to bring about repentance and change, and we pray for revival, not just in your church, but in our nation and in our world. Not for our glory, but for your name's sake. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm always amazed, you know, when, when, you, uh, when you commit to uh, preaching through the, the whole counsel of God's word, verse by verse, through a book, God gives us exactly what we need to hear when we need to hear it. It's really amazing, and I, I, I shouldn't be amazed by now because it's happened so often. Uh, our, our passage today starts off with this hugely important and very timely question, and it's actually a rhetorical question. He starts off saying, who is wise and understanding among you? And immediately, if we're honest, the little hands of our hearts are saying, me, me. I'm wise, I'm understanding, because we generally, if we're honest with ourselves, we believe that we are just natural sages that understand how to navigate life. Uh, Proverbs 21.2 tells us this, that every way of a man is right in his own eyes, that we think we're right. We naturally think that we are right. Uh, But Proverbs 21.2, the end of that verse says, but the Lord weighs the heart. In other words, compared with what God knows, compares with what, compared with what God understands, we might not be all that wise and understanding as we think we are. And in fact, Isaiah 5 has a pretty strong warning for those of us who think that we are wise, which is all of us, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Uh, and so heeding that warning is really the first step in order to gain what God calls wisdom. Uh, the irony of gaining God's wisdom is to understand that we don't have it, you know, uh, to, to understand that, that God is wise and we are not. And, and the Bible has a special word for that realization, that God is great, that he is good, that he is wise and we are not. The Bible calls that word fear, okay, not in the sense of, of terror, although if you don't have a relationship with God, if you're not in his family, that might be an appropriate emotion. But, but fear, in, in a biblical sense, when it says that, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, that fear is a reverence, it's a respect. And multiple times the Bible repeats that phrase, Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Job 28.28, 28, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Proverbs 15.33, the fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. In other words, in order to have wisdom from God, we need to first be a worshiper of God. And I think uh, uh, with an evangelical Christianity, too often there's an overemphasis on our worth, our value, our intelligence, our importance, and we minimize God's worth, God's awesomeness. God's power. 
And uh, only when we begin to see God for who he truly is can we be humble and receive, be willing to receive the wisdom that he offers us. Wisdom's not something that we grow into. Wisdom's not something that we earn. Um, Although that might be true of, of human wisdom, wisdom, God's wisdom, it's a gift from God. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 5, uh, James tells us if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives, gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. All right, wisdom is a gift from God. And I think uh, most Christians would agree that, that wisdom from God is a good thing, all right, that we want to be able to live in God's will. Living within God's will is the safest place for us to be. We know God is good, Uh, we know he loves us, and so we want to live our lives within God's will for our lives. And wisdom is the ability to make decisions to live within God's will. It's a given ability to make the decisions to live within God's will. And on the flip side, we as Christians also know when we are not in the center of God's will. We have the uh, the, uh, person of the Trinity. We have the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. When we don't see the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, uh, meekness, uh, gentleness, self-control, when we don't exhibit those characteristics, we're like, maybe I'm not in the center of God's will. Because when we're not in the center of God's will, Uh, when we're not uh, acting according to his wisdom, we don't experience his peace. Uh, We get frustrated, we're angry, we're anxious, we're uncontrolled. Uh, We break relationships, we're not loving, we're not selfless, we're not controlled. And so we find ourselves in this downward spiral that's often accompanied by discipline and pain because God loves us. Um, And we tend to think, Uh, Again, when we're going through storms and we're going through trials and we say, okay, God said to ask for wisdom, I should ask him for wisdom. We tend to think that wisdom is the ability to understand why God does what he does. To understand what God is doing through this trial, that is not wisdom. All right, wisdom is the ability to act in the trial. It's the ability to make the right decisions in the trial. Um, J.I. Packer, he used this illustration, great theologian, um, of a train yard. And he said, when you stand on, the, on the, the deck and you see the trains up close, you can notice how they move and, and whether they're on time or late from a, a, a very narrow perspective. And he said, it's when you go up to the control room that you get to see all the comings and goings, why they're late, where the construction is, uh, um, what's happening with the whole picture. And he said, uh, we tend to think that, that wisdom from God is being in the control room, seeing everything. And he says, that's not what it is. Uh, wisdom from God is more like the ability to, to drive a car. Um, that uh, you don't have to understand all the, the comings and goings on traffic. I mean, I was a traffic engineer. I worked as a traffic engineer during um, uh, my, my uh, seminary time. And, um, and so I did traffic flow studies and um, you know, timing of construction flows and road geometries and all this stuff. And so I have like a control level understanding of traffic, but that doesn't make me a good driver. It doesn't help me uh, to be able to brake at the right time. And, and actually, despite the, the political incorrectness of the statement, um, that you have to have been given abilities to be a good driver. Okay, that the DMV understands this. So you pass a written test, yes, and so you can memorize a lot of facts. But they also you know, a test to make sure that, that you can see, you know, with, with AIDS or without. The, they, um, they, they want to make sure that uh, they, they sit in the car and they drive with you to make sure that you brake at the right time, that you know how to turn, to, um, uh, you know, because there are a lot of people that, that pass everything and then fail the actual practice test. Um, I was on another missions trip in Australia, a pretty good youth missions trip. I was a youth leader, uh, you know, and Colin's like, amen, let's do that. Um, But uh, um, so I was a youth leader uh, on a missions trip to Australia, and we took these students there. And and one of the students, uh, the day after she got back, she took her driver's test and failed because she drove on the wrong side of the road. (laughs) <laughs> over the, over the, the, the days that we were there, you know, she was used to, okay, driving on the left side of the road, and she came back, and, and the driver was like, do you realize you're on the wrong side of the road? And she's like, oh, you know, and, and uh, she failed a test, which is probably the right decision to make. But a, a good driver, um, it, you know, has given abilities, good eyesight, good hearing, sharp reflexes, concentration. Um, you can't learn those things from a book. There are abilities that are given. 
And uh, um, wisdom is the ability to apply the knowledge, its ability to make the right turns, um, uh, to make the decisions to make the right turns. And so godly wisdom is a gift given from God to navigate the twists and turns of life. And uh, in our passage, verses 15 and 17, it says that wisdom comes down from above. It is a gift from God. So how do you know? Um, how do you know if, if, if the wisdom that, that you have is from God or if it's earthly wisdom? Well, that's the, the, what James is going to dig into. And first of all, if you've been given wisdom from God, you have to be a genuine Christian. We see this from the context that all the way now through James, James has been saying uh, there is evidence to being a genuine, authentic Christian. The way that you respond through trials, what you say, what you do, how you use your tongue, uh, these are evidences of being an authentic Christian. And so God, given wisdom, it's going to have a result. It can be seen. It can be witnessed. It's not what you know. It's who you are. Uh, look at verse 13. He asked this question, who is wise and understanding among you? And we all kind of go, me, 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 I'm, I'm wise. And then James springs the track he, here. He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. James says, hey, it's easy to say you're wise. Now show it. Show me. True wisdom is not what you do. It's who you are. All right, someone with wisdom from God is someone whose heart has been fundamentally changed, and it affects, and there's different areas here that we see that, that it affects. Um, it, 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 it is seen by our good conduct. It's shown in our works. It's shown in our meekness. All right, conduct is the behavior. Uh, works are the deeds, the, the way that we serve others, uh, the, the public display of of. Of, of what you do for others, and then God's wisdom also um, affects our, our attitude. Our entire self is affected. Meekness is the attitude that, that is uh, the result. So people who are truly wise, they are worshipers of God. Um, we know this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, that, that when people are worshipers of God, they've been changed by him, and it affects everything, their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength, the way that they uh, serve others and love others. And, and so meekness there, that attitude... Uh, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, it's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. A meek person is not a pushover. Moses was uh, described as meek. Jesus described himself as meek. Meekness is power under control. Okay, it is, it is not somebody that is weak. It is somebody that is submissive. It's used of a horse that has been tamed. Uh, the horse is powerful, uh, but it is submitted to the direction of the driver. Um, and, and for us as Christians, um, our will is submitted to God's will. All right? That is submission. That is what it means to be a worshiper. Um, and so the, we are worshipers of God. We are the church because our hearts have been changed. Our, our, our minds are being renewed. Uh, and so what we say at the end of each service, go be the church, that's, uh, you know, act like the church. Act like who you are. Your hearts have been changed. Your minds are being renewed. Go act like it. But if we haven't been changed, or if we're acting like it hasn't been changed, James is going to say, don't go on pretending like it has. Look at verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. And so earthly wisdom, we're going to see, um, makes decisions not from God's wisdom, but out of jealousy and selfish ambition. And say, well, okay, well, that's just for non-Christians. Well, um, can Christians um, act as though they are non-Christians? Yes. Can Christians not be filled with the Spirit? Okay, they can be, they're, they, they're sealed into up with the Spirit, but being filled with the Spirit means that you are being controlled by the Spirit. We can actually quench the Spirit as Christians. And uh, when you read Paul, um, when he talks about quenching the Spirit, it's in relation to how we interact with each other. And so, um, uh, so you can act out of jealousy and selfish ambition even as a Christian. And jealousy, in the Greek, it's actually two words, zelon, which is where we get the word zeal, and uh, pikron, which means bitter. And so jealousy is literally bitter zeal, bitter zeal. It's getting so worked up about seeing others succeed or being blessed uh, that you have to work hard just to see them fail. 
right? Now, now we, we never see that in real life, right? Um, no. One of the commentaries I read uh, shared a story about two men that lived in a city, and one of the men was named Envy, and the other was named Covetous. And, uh, and, and so the king of the city called these, these men together and said, I'm going to give you anything you ask for, but there's one condition. Um, whoever speaks first, he will get exactly what he requested. The other individual will get double. And so he points to Envy and says, okay, you choose first. And Envy looks at uh, Covetous, and he looks at the king, and he says, I want you to take out one of my eyes. All right? That's a good description of uh, a bitter zeal. I would rather suffer and if it means that somebody else suffers more. Uh, I, I would rather sink this ship you know, than, than to see others reach their destination. And you see this in politics every day. right? There are people that are actually celebrating what is happening in Afghanistan because they want to see their political rivals embarrassed. Uh, there are people that are celebrating when people get covid or when their constituents get COVID, uh, because uh, they can now um, uh, look more, you know, whatever it is, you know, than their political rival. And so those are wrong in politics, they're, and they're anathema to the church. And so closely related jealousy is selfish ambition. Paul used that same word in Philippians 1 to describe what people were doing. They were sharing the gospel uh, to, uh, to, um, to hurt Paul when he was in prison. Again, p- political games that have no place in the church. Um, uh, when I was uh, right out of seminary, I worked as, a, as an executive pastor, kind of overseeing the, the business aspects of a church um, that had you know, a couple buildings in their campus. And, um, uh, and, and so we had these business meetings that I feared. All right? And I, we've been so blessed here at Calvary Bible. We have great business meetings. Um, uh, and and they're, they're wonderful. But at this church, we had these business meetings, and, and I would lose sleep over them because they got so contentious. They were so um, awful and divisive, and the, the pastors and staff were attacked, and it was, just, it was just this awful environment. And it got so bad to the point where I would say these are only open to members of the church. If you're a visitor, don't come because I was so embarrassed about these business meetings of the church. And it turned out that it was basically just one individual. Uh, and in general, you know, he was a nice guy. But at these business meetings, like, it was like something snapped and changed. And all of a sudden, he was aggressive and he was mean. And he, uh, he, was, he would attack people. And, and I, eventually, I confronted him. You know, I'm, I'm this young new pastor. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go in gentle and just ask him, you know, why it is he's doing what he's doing. And he said something that I've never forgotten. It was so shocking to me. He said, when the pastor says amen at the end of the service, the business meetings were after the service. When the pastor says amen... The Holy Spirit leaves the room. I was like, oh, okay, that explains a lot uh, of what you're doing. And, and to his credit, at least what he knew what he at least he knew what he was doing was not godly, but uh, he was taking this, this separation between earthly wisdom and God's wisdom to the extreme and saying, okay, business meetings of the church, that's human wisdom. And uh, what happens before the pastor says, Amen, that's God's wisdom. And, and so, you know, we had this conversation, and I was trying to say, okay, you know, does God's church cease to exist? You know, when the pastor says amen, well, no, okay, the church keeps going. Okay, well, who owns the church, right? Okay, the church belongs to Jesus Christ, okay? Would Jesus Christ want his church run according to human wisdom or his wisdom, right? Okay, so we had these conversations, but um, our worship doesn't stop. We don't stop being Christians when we say amen at the end of the service, okay? We'll see you, and next week you can become a Christian again. Um, you know, and James, he would have loved laying into this individual. He would have done a much better job than I did uh, because he commands here, uh, if this is you, out of jealousy, selfish ambition, do not boast and be false to the truth. It's actually two commands. Don't boast. Don't be false to the truth. Stop lying to yourself that human wisdom is the same as spiritual wisdom. And so often churches will, will bind this lie that they need to embrace human wisdom in order to see the church succeed and be healthy. And, uh, and, and so you'll see this happen. Okay, we're going to increase attendance, so we're going to do all these tricks and business things. And, and business isn't wrong and unspiritual, but um, they, will, uh, they will sacrifice spiritual health in order to uh, look like they are a, a healthy organization. And on the inside, it's rotting. 
And, and they were saying, okay, look at the increased attendance. God is blessing the ministry, but it's an empty boast. It's a false truth. God's wisdom wasn't behind it. Uh, in fact, David, um, he said, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers, those who build it, labor what? In vain, right? It's empty. It doesn't mean anything. God's wisdom is not behind that growth. It's born of jealousy, and oftentimes it's, I just want to be the biggest church in town. I want to be the, uh, the, the most successful pastor in town. And that is a jealous and selfish ambition that is driving those decisions. And James warns where that kind of wisdom comes from. Verse 15 said, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wow. I mean, I, I mean, those were painful church business meetings for me. I never realized that they felt like hell because they were from hell. And I'm not, being, I'm not cussing or being crude here. James literally says that the people who claim to be a Christian uh, bring, that brings political divisiveness into the church out of their jealousy and selfish ambition, that wisdom is literally demonic. First time here in the New Testament that, that, that the, the word demon is used as an adjective here. It is demonisk. Look at the results. Look at verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So when, once you start getting beneath the, 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 the false exterior, you know, the, the mask there, you start to see that there is disunity, there's disorder, there's evil, there's wickedness, there's sin that is, that is happening underneath. Um, and, and so you look at what is happening in our, in our government, you look at what's happening overseas, um, and you can see the disunity, the, the vileness of, of what is happening. But instead of just looking out there and saying, oh, yeah, there's a lot of evil out there, what about us? Um, what's the situation like in your workplace? Uh, what's the situation like in your schools? What's the situation like in your homes? Are they peaceable, fair, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, as James is going to say? Or is there disorder in every vile practice? And so maybe the issue isn't uh, the work, the school, the home, but the type of wisdom that is guiding the decisions in those places. And I love the description of the fruit of godly wisdom in verse 17. But the wisdom from above, again, this is God's wisdom, the wisdom gifted from God is first pure and then you have all these descriptions after this peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Uh, that purity describes the motives behind it. All right, the motives are not selfish and jealous. Uh, the motives are pure. It's, uh, it, it, is, it is a pure motive that is guiding that decision. Um, godly wisdom is also not divisive. It makes peace. All right, and peace doesn't mean that you abandon your principles um, or uh, overlook unpopular truths. Um, you don't have to avoid every and all conflict. Uh, in fact, we are called to admonish each other. In fact, James 4, when we get to this uh, little preview, it's going to tell us um, how and when to fight as Christians. If you want to learn how to fight, come back, and, and we'll teach you how to fight well in church. Um, but... but uh, um, uh, but we are called to admonish one another, confront sin, but to do so in a way that does not cause division. And, and for now, we'll say that when Christians are filled with the Spirit and they make decisions based on God's wisdom, it draws them together, not apart. That's, the, that's one of the big fruits of whether you're using God's wisdom or human wisdom. Does it draw people together or does it draw them apart? And you see the results here. Um, we can go over this really quickly. Gentleness. Yeah, you know what that is. A gentle person is over, willing to overlook uh, um, uh, hurts that they experience. Um, they, they're able to tolerate people that are, are different and act different than they do. And tolerance doesn't mean acceptance of, of someone else's beliefs. It means that you tolerate their beliefs, that you're respectful, gentle, kind, open to reason, uh, that they're teachable. As well, there's a humility there. Um, I, I love the example of David and Abigail. Remember when Abigail's husband Nabal uh, um, uh, upset David, and David like put on a sword, gathered his swords. We're going to take this guy out, and he's on his way to annihilate this guy who's partying drunk at home. And his wife realizes what's going to happen. Abigail comes out, meets David, and says, "This is not going to look good for you and your kingdom." 
right? When you are king, this is going to be a stain on you. And, and David's like, bless you because I was going to do this very thing. And, 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 and he listens to her. He relents. And, and God ends up taking care of Nabal in his own way. Um, there's a teachableness. Um, someone who's not teachable, the Bible calls what? A fool, right? Uh, the next result, uh, mercy and good fruits, all right? Not oranges and apples and bananas there, but, but uh, good results, blessings that, that multiply, mercy, spiritual blessings, impartiality. We talked about the, the sin of partiality in chapter 2, uh, that somebody that is impartial is consistent and treats people fairly. They do not make different decisions based upon somebody's skin color, based upon someone's ethnicity, based upon someone's gender and social economic status, and so on. They're fair, they're impartial in, in the decisions and how they act towards others. Uh, and then closely related is that word sincerity. In Greek, that's literally without hypocrisy. There's no mask. What you see is what you get. There's no um, uh, you know, pretending here. Uh, the, the person that you see up here is the same person my kids see at home, right? Although a little less caffeinated and a lot less talkative. Um, but, but there's a consistency and lastly, when Christians act according to God's wisdom, the result is going to be unity and righteousness. Verse 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Righteousness does not grow in a climate of bitterness and selfishness. Uh, it thrives when Christians are at peace, when there's unity, uh, oneness with each other. And when Christians are filled with the Spirit, when they are guided by God's wisdom, it draws them together, not apart. I've got a little illustration here, all right? And this illustration actually came from A.W. Tozer. Um, and he gave the illustration of imagining the situation of having 100 pianos in a room, all right? I mean, imagine the chaos. That would be, in general, I know that. Um, <laughs> but imagine trying to get all these hundred pianos to, to play the same thing and try to tune them all to each other. And there are hundreds of strings in a piano, right? And, and some, of the, some of those strings have three strings apiece. Imagine the, the chaos of trying to tune a hundred pianos to each other. And he says, it's impossible for you to listen to all the other pianos and try to get those 100 pianos to tune to each other. He said, the way that you tune 100 pianos to each other is you take one standard. You take a tuning fork, um, and you know, this vibrates at 440 cycles per second, and you strike it, and you can, you can hear you know, Let me see if I can get this. You, you hear the tone? All right, so, uh, and so that tone doesn't change, all right? It, it, it doesn't change. And so you could take this tuning fork around with 100 pianos, and they all tune to the same tuning fork, and then by definition, they're all in tune with each other because they've tuned to the same standard. And Tozer says that's what a pursuing unity looks like for the church, that I don't have to look at all the other Christians and try to adjust my life to their lives and, and, and our church to their churches and try to, to find oneness somehow by looking at the other churches. What I do as a Christian, what we do as a church, is we tune our lives and our church to Jesus Christ, who's our standard. And, and, and if we are tuned to Jesus Christ, if we are making decisions by his wisdom and, and other churches and Christians are tuning their lives to Jesus Christ, then by definition, we are unified. And so I don't have to worry about what other churches and Christians are doing. I worry about, am I tuned to Jesus Christ? And let them tune their lives to Jesus Christ, and then we will be unified. That's what unity is. And so looking at this passage, what's the so what? You know, it, we have two commands in this passage, um, verse 13, the second one of verse 14. The first one for Christians, if you have a heart changed by Jesus, if your life is being tuned to him, then show it. Let it ring out. Show it in three ways, in your conduct, in your works, and in your attitude. Show it. The second command for non-Christians, and I would ask, add those who are not acting like Christians, if your heart has not been changed, if you're not a Christian, and it's important to add, if you're not acting like a Christian, you're not being filled with the Spirit, you're being driven by jealousy and selfish ambition, then keep your mouth shut and stop lying to yourself. 
You're not just hurting yourself. You are staining the name of Jesus. You're, you're giving every seeker out there another excuse to avoid church people because it bolsters their claims that churches are just filled with hypocrites. The only way to become a true worshiper of God is through Jesus Christ, and true worshipers of God live it, they show it, it affects their entire selves. The Bible uses a phrase to describe that kind of person. That kind of person is in Christ. Over 160 times that phrase is used, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. In fact, turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians 1. I'm going to show you this passage here before we go to communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul is talking about the difference between human wisdom and God's wisdom here. And he's in a situation, the Corinthian church, they were obsessed with human wisdom. The Greeks, they, they enjoyed rhetoric. And Paul, he was trained by the best of the best. I mean, he could have, he could have laid down with any one of those philosophers. Uh, but he says, I didn't come with you, come to you, and try to convince you of how smart and intelligent and how, how adept I am at this, this skill of rhetoric. He says, I came to you uh, with this message that is considered foolishness foolishness. He said it's a stumbling block to the Jews and it is, it is folly to the Greeks. And he says uh, and, and, and verse 21 uh, in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, he says, for, uh, for since in the wisdom of God, all right, again, this is God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, human wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach. Again, the cross does not make sense. It does not make sense that, that the second person of the Trinity is sinless, um, tempted in every way as we are yet without sin, that he would die on a cross in the place of sinners. It is, it is nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. And it is folly to, the, to us, but it is God's wisdom. And he says, through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. All right, that's the human wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, that's us, to those of us who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then in verse 30, it says, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see that Jesus is God's wisdom. To have received God's wisdom is to have first received Jesus Christ. And we said that, that you, can't, uh, receive G, G, you can't receive God's wisdom. It can't be given to you unless you are first a Christian, unless you, are, you have a heart that has been changed. Only Christ fulfills the law. Only Christ satisfies the law. Only Christ um, perfectly, um, uh, perfectly fulfills every expectation that the Bible lays out. And if you've if you received Christ, the wisdom of God, it affects all of you. It affects your lifestyle, your actions, your attitude. Without it, there's division, discord. With it, there's peace, peace with God, peace with others. And that is what I need. That's what you need. And that is what our world needs. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Colin, and we are going to uh, look at a physical and celebrate a physical reminder of the peace that we enjoy with Christ and the peace uh, that, that was bought for us and also the peace that we have with each other as a result of our peace with God. The word communion itself uh, points to this, this, uh, this fact that we are one. We commune with one another. It implies togetherness. Peace with God and peace with each other. And if you're watching online, if you're here in person and you are not at peace, you don't have peace at home, you don't have peace, and you can say that is because I'm not at peace with God, maybe today is the day that you would decide I'm going to get right with God. And you can do that before we celebrate communion. Um, if, if you are not a peace, if you need more information, if you want to talk to me after that, just let, let it pass by. Don't celebrate this. This is for those that are in Christ. But if you want to get right with God, three things to remember. A, B, C. A, you admit your sin. 
I'm needy. I can't save myself. B, you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again as payment for your sin, conquering sin and death. And C, you call. Romans 10, 13, for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Colin. So as we continue on in our time of worship, thinking about, you know, the aspect of communion. It's good to have some context in this. You know, in the Old Testament, what we find is an old covenant. And one aspect of the old covenant was the fact that there would be a lamb that would be sawed out, that would be looked over. And that lamb would be sacrificed during Passover to atone for the sins of that household. And the blood would be taken and sprinkled on the doorposts and the lintels. And thinking about that, understanding that it was the lamb that was sacrificed during our one of the songs previous there was a line in there that said, your goodness is running after me. And what is the application in that? What is a biblical example of God's goodness running after us? Well, I think we find it in Isaiah 53, verse 7, where it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. You see, in Isaiah, it speaks about this lamb. And a continuation of that in John chapter 1, verse 29, where John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so in this new covenant, we find a better Lamb. We find an eternal Lamb. We find a sufficient Lamb. And that is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is what your goodness is running after me. And Isaiah, it's prophesied in the new covenant, it's fulfilled. And in Revelation, one day we are going to stand around the throne. And there will be the lamb as though it was slain. Which is talking about, once again, Jesus. And so as we partake in communion, we look back at the cross of Calvary, realizing that Jesus, being spotless, being sinless, went to the Mount of Skulls. He was put upon the cross. He broke his body for you and for me, and he shed his blood. We look with this excited expectancy that one day the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the righteous judge will come back for his church. And then we look inwardly. The Bible is very clear. If there is any unrepentant sin, if there's anything that is separating your fellowship with God today to make it right, to do business, to go to God, before participating in the elements. So I want to take a few moments. And I want us to look inwardly.
Matthew 26. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins.
give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. I have a hope in my heart. You know, that affects our message. It affects what we do. Jesus is the only name by which people are saved.